Um, Tom Segura teaches Matt Rife how to be famous. It's courtesy of um, Podcast Cringe. Let's see this. Let's see what this is saying. Big up Podcast Cringe. Come on, load, you fucker. People, people's instinctual re uh, rebuttal on the internet is go, oh, you, you have all this time to respond to people. Yeah, man. Yeah. I woke up at 4 p.m. Didn't yeah. have to work till 8. Yeah. I have so much time. I have time. Right? Yeah. A few moments later. There's a point where you're just going to be like, yeah, I'm a pretty busy guy with a lot going on. Yeah. And if you think I suck, God bless. I got things to do. Welcome back to another. <laughs> hey. Being famous is fucking awesome, isn't it? Being successful and being famous on your own is super amazing because it's harder to do to be a Matt. Okay, obviously, yeah, the looks are going to help. Fair enough. But it's harder to be a Matt Reif than a Brendan Shaw because you have to kind of rely on your own, right? You like you rely on doing it by yourself. But the benefit of being a Matt Reif instead of a Brendan is that once you do make it and you become undeniable, all of these fucking lemons... All of these fucking, you know, um, JRE fucking dick suckers and shit, they're going to start circling you and wanting to have a piece of you also and stand next to you because you did it on your own and you got your own fucking thing going on and you're hotter than fish grease. That's the beauty of it. And you see it happening in real time. Matt rife has got fucking Tom Segura sitting down there trying to be his de facto mentor. <laughs> I love it, bro. Look at Matt, look at Tom tell, giving him lessons on how to act and shit, how to conduct himself. I love it. Let's go. Another video today. We've got Tom Segura with your girlfriend's favorite TikTok comedian. Matt Rife took some time out of his very busy schedule to learn from a comedy veteran who has multiple Netflix specials, several podcasts, and dozens of bodies <laughs> in his basement. And it was quite the conversation. What started out as a get-to-know Matt Rife turned into this little therapy session where Tom Segura gave his younger, better-looking protege <laughs> career advice on how to handle fame, fortune, and of course, those angry fans who love to hate. Dude, I, I will, really? I'll, I'll copy and paste tour dates in a comment section and be like, pull up. Like, <laughs> I'll, I'll do, I'm, I'm waiting to fight somebody at a venue. I can't wait. Okay. <laughs> Cannot <laughs> you, wait, dude. You, you gotta let that go, dude. I'm, I know, I know that's me being 27 yeah, and egotistical, yeah, but yeah. it's just like, I, no. I can't stay. I threatened to f somebody's grandma one time. No, that's cute. Now, as you can imagine, Tom Segura giving anybody advice on how to be a good person can only end in a cringe compilation full of hypocrisy, double speak, and straight up lies. So we'll get to that in a moment. But first, for those of you who aren't familiar with androgynous TikTok stars, here's a. <laughs> androgynous. <laughs> I've not heard that term in ages. You remember that, that was a big thing, innit? Nowadays, androgyny is just non binary, innit? Do you remember there was a time when people, there was a model, I forgot his, oh, that's what his, what was his name again? Was it Petro something? There was a particular model that basically looked like Paris Hilton, but it was a boy. Fuck, bro, what was his name? But no, nowadays, no one wants to be androgynous. Everyone just wants to be non-binary. But that was a big trend at one point. Like that kind of like, actually, there is something quite mesmerizing more visually about a, an androgynous person than a non-binary person. I think so. Especially like when they've got like an ultra chad facial structure, but they have very feminine features, you know? It's something really odd to look at that. Wow, look at that person's face. They've got, the good, they've got a mix of like a masculine jawline, but they've also got these really soft feminine type features, right? Like there's something a bit more interesting about that than just being like, I don't know, you know, some girl that chops her tits off and colors her hair blue. It's like, eh, I guess, isn't it? It's cool, but, you know, I don't know. The brief background on Matt Rife's rise to fame. When did things like really change? Because I remember I was in a vehicle on tour and my photographer was in the back and he goes, uh, you know, Matt Rife? <laughs> my photographer was blowing my back out in the back of the van. And I was like, yeah. He's like, yeah, you seen like his crowd work? And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, you haven't seen the clips? And I was like, the f are you talking about? I had no idea what he's talking about. So he sends me a clip. And I was like, yeah, it's really good. And then I look and it says like 19 million views. I was like, what the f Oh, yeah. And then oh, you see? 
You see what I mean? That's the thing that I don't like a little bit. As much as I'm sure it must be nice for Matt Rife to get a little bit of this dick sucking from the industry, it must feel odd to know that these guys are only sucking you off because you get crazy numbers on your own. You don't have any of the Joe Rogan plug-in, nothing to do with the comedy store, nothing to do with that sort of LA scene. You kind of did it on your own and they just can't understand how that's possible because they all do this whole like, let me come on your podcast, let me come on my podcast, then you'd say how good I am, we talk about comedy, then we plug our days and we do marketing videos. Like They do the same shit, right, to kind of inflate their fucking, you know, how they big they are online. But he did it on his own. That's why they're so mesmerized. So it must be an odd feeling for Matt Rife to be like, these guys don't really respect my comedy, really. They just like me because I get crazy numbers compared to them. And I don't do it with their help. And then it was like, I looked at the next one. It said like 25 million views. I was like, what is going on? Like it was an explosion. Mm -hmm. I had seen you announce, I think your millionth, follower on instagram or something like that okay. like i saw it like maybe it like scrolled down a little bit I was uh -huh. like, oh. and then it was like two million three million i was like this jump is like yeah very very it's growing in the tiktok thing august of last year was the first time that like i started to get a bit of a following when people would start to come out to a show july of last year so uh -huh. 13 months ago uh -huh. i was doing i was maybe profiting $150 to fly myself out to do a one-nighter in Philly. Wow. To like Seriously. 80 people would that's show crazy. up. So I, that's crazy. That's a crazy come up, though, to be fair. <laughs> that's a crazy come up. That also goes to show that the algorithm does help, innit? Once you, once you land on the algorithm and you get that boost, it could take you a sky high because he always looked the way he looked. So you can't say his looks got him there because for, he says, what, a year ago, he was struggling to sell tickets and he had to fly himself out to places. So that's pretty crazy. A year ago. Wow, that's pretty insane. You got to admit, that's yeah. some incredible growth. Good luck to him. I hope he makes the most of it before his looks fade and he has to actually write funny jokes. And speaking of- Ah, uh, come on, podcast cringe. Come on. That's unfair. Because he's, he's better than a lot of people, to be fair. I still think he's not that- good but like i said i'm just impressed that he's just been able to do it on his own that for me is a big thing like do it on your own he doesn't seem like he's a clout chaser or desperate for the fame thing he does it on his own he's got the ladies out there sweating in the crowd ready to fucking give him everything and so far no fucking crazy stories about him being a diddler you know what i mean i like it that's good but i still think He's not that much better than Brendan. They're probably neck and neck, comedy-wise. In my opinion, it's that same sort of level. Looks, our boy Tom is looking great. For those of you who don't know, Tom used to be a fat slob who wrote funny jokes and had awesome stand-up routines. Then he got rich and famous, snapped his arm trying to do a layup, and then hired a personal trainer to get him into shape. Now, in addition to being a comedian, he's become a motivational speaker, <laughs> fitness guru, and serial entrepreneur. <laughs> Ham cramp hamstring. right now? <laughs> yeah, hamstring cramp. God, I know. In the You have a baseball on the back of your leg? No, I just, I'm holding it. Hamstring just cramped up. Oh, we, we did deadlifts right before I came here. By the way, you look... <laughs> no, he's doing that old man thing. He's doing that old man thing. He's trying to... He's trying to show the young guy that he works out too. Hey, look, I'm a workout guy. Look at my leg. I've got cramps. Cramps mean I do exercise. Oh, come on. Big up Austin Casey. I appreciate you. I brother. noticed when Rife was on Rogan, he was talking about how grateful he was to be in huge venues. Then Rogan chimed in about being in bigger venues than high when he was with Chappelle Lowell. Wow. i got to watch that then. I missed that one. Wow. Big up Austin Casey. I missed that one. Joe Rogan trying to uh, <laughs> one up Matt Rife is fucking hilarious. I didn't, I didn't watch that one. I got, I got to watch it. Big up Austin Casey. <laughs> Rogan one upping Austin fucking Matt Rife is fucking brilliant. I've definitely got to watch that. That is good. That is fucking good. Classic. But um, oh, what's Tom doing, bro? He's trying to show off to the kid. Look, I do, I do deadlifts. I'm fit. Look great, man. Thanks, bro. You look fantastic. Thanks, How man. much are you down over the past like year? Around forty pounds or something. That's incredible. Yeah. What made you, What made you want to make that change? 
Just being sick of it. Of just being fat? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you feel like it's affected you on stage, like being in better shape? Or because you're so established, you're, you've been established as a comedian, people will already respect your comedy? Um, I don't think... Like, do you get any being like oh tom's changed he got skinny yes. now yes he's trying to he's trying to be something else now like, yeah but that? i yeah but i completely dismiss and ignore that like a hundred percent you Good. know i mean yeah it's usually it's dudes mm -hmm. um which is insane but all your fans are dudes though D tom relax tom's trying to go on as if like you're not matt rife let's relax tom segura you are not matt rife let's relax your fans were dudes when you were fat your fans would all be dudes when you get skinny. You're never going to have women fans. Like, let's relax, bro. Yeah, they go, bring back Fat Tom. Why? <laughs> they, because he was nicer. They, they go, like, that's when, that's, when I, that's when I found you, or that's when I liked you more than you were fine. I'm like, this is nonsense. You know? Yo, no, nah, nah, okay. Lack of self-awareness is strong here. But anyway, it is what it is. Because of the way I look, that's I mean, that's insane. It's, it's it's nonsense. I just, I completely, I mean, I'll never entertain it. I don't, I don't pay any mind to it. I don't, I don't respond to it. Wow, okay, hang on a second. Let's back up that truck. Did Matt Reif just say it's insane that people judge Tom based on the way he looks? <laughs> so the pretty boy whose audience is prominently women is complaining that people shouldn't judge comedians based on their looks? So if women stop going to his shows, who's going to buy the tickets, bro? <laughs> That's sad. Eat some bread and make me laugh, Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> have a fucking sandwich man and get back to being funny you fucking troglodyte oh god middle-aged fat dudes well no that's tom's audience and that's one of the big lies that tom tells himself people haven't turned on tom because he got into shape and started looking after his health no that's a good thing good for him we all hope he lives a long and happy life <laughs> Koyla, you're a cunt. <laughs> I'd rather have the AZ cardigan than that six pack. What's wrong with the cardigan? Why are you why are you guys insulting my cardigan? It's just like a regular look. It's not, like, it's not that deep. It's a regular little thing because it's cold now. I don't want to turn on the heating. I'm trying to save money. I'm trying to save the environment. So I've got this little, you know, I've got this little hoodie, you know? It's little it's little shepherd's thing, you know what I mean? I am the shepherd. Right? Comedy comment what comedy commentary shepherd, right? That's what I am. No. Off to the comedy store we go um, um, We might go to the life factory. <laughs> People are turning against him because he changed, not us. Ever since he came into fame and fortune and got into shape, he turned into this egotistical control freak that forgot how to just laugh at himself. Exactly. Tom was a great exactly. stand-up comic exactly. up until a few years ago. Exactly. Some of you probably don't realize I still have Tom in my top 10 comedians. He's a really funny guy. Same, same, same here. I think out of all of Joe Rogan's friends, like close friends within the inner circle of, of the JRE verse, I personally think Tom is one of the funniest. Probably next to Ari. In terms of stand-up, Ari's stand-up is very underrated. He's really funny. He might be a bit of a cunt on podcasts. He doesn't come across the nicest. You really probably wouldn't want to be his friend. But stand-up-wise, Ari's fucking crazy. So Ari's good. Ari's great. Tom is also great. Uh, who do I think of in Joe's circle? Um, Mark Norman, of course, because he's new, and Shane. But the original crew, I always thought Tom was really funny. I thought unfairly earlier on, when Bert and Tom were, war, were more attached, people, I think, used to not respect Tom's stand-up because they thought of him with Bert, but they're not the same. They're not the same. They're not the same. Like, And the issue I also have with Tom, his, his stand-up has kind of went down, and he's also his podcast humour is also not the same. Your mum's house is not the same anymore, man. That show used to be so fucking good, bro, and it's not as funny as anymore at all, and I don't know what happened. Again, maybe it's because he got skinny i don't I'd, I'd i'd hate for that to be the case i think it probably has more to do with the money to be fair and the fame and the level he's gone at because now he's fucking touring the world doing arenas like for real for real that's some big money you know what i mean that's that's a different change than what he was doing before so maybe that's changed the way he looks at stuff i'm not really too sure um people are saying ari sucks here um crf 1000 l us say that 
Um, Curtis is a pill used to be him as a regular cool guy. He's the opposite now. Exactly, Curtis. That's a good point, actually. He's a regular dude. Now he's changed. How late will be Promised Land? Back uh, <laughs> Big up Jubu. Back when Tom was Mexican. <laughs> yeah, true. No. Where's he from? Where's his family from, Tom? His mum's from where? Um, uh, Is it Honduras? Is it Peru or something? I think it's Peru, right? I think his mum's per Peruvian. I think Peruvian. Um, Brendan already caught chasing underage girls on Instagram. He's crying hard when Dalia got caught. He had been doing it too. There's a fear of him being caught remorse. What? Really? John Adventure? When that happened? The Instagram thing. I don't know. About, I haven't heard about that. Rogan's a funny. I never heard it. Joey Diaz and Tony. Joey Diaz stand-up comedy is probably for Josie. I think I like Joey Diaz's stand-up comedy, but I don't think it's for everybody. It's a very specific type of taste. Tony Hinchcliffe, I'm not really a fan of at all. Personally, stand-up, it's not really for me. But I like Joey Tom comedy, but I think he's a more of a he's more of a acquired taste. But I think people would definitely like Ari and Tom, hands down, without a shadow of a doubt. But that's because his old stuff was so raw and he felt like one of us. He made observations about the world that we could relate to. Now we get hours and hours of his podcasts where he's either bragging about all his shiny toys, lecturing us on how to stop being poor and pathetic, or indulging in a therapy session with Bert Kreischer where they obviously both need to seek professional help off camera. But this Matt Rife guy, geez, who knew he was such a hothead? Lucky his audience are mostly women. <sighs> I'm so confrontational as a person. Like, it drives me insane. I can't beat the f out of these people. Yeah. But then you have to sit back and go, well, I'm really allowing these people to to, exactly. to determine how I, f how I feel you throughout gotta, my day. You got to, like... And it's f***ing pathetic. Exactly. Like, you're, li you're literally living your dream. Yeah, of course. And, and it's like, you can't let someone's bitterness or negativity yeah. suck that joy out of you. Now, the first thing... <laughs> Mental, Tom. You need to know is that this podcast is an older recording. Sure, it was released yesterday, but it's probably a few weeks old. Matt Reif mentioned he was just about to do Lauren Compton's first date podcast, and that episode's almost a month old already. But there's nothing wrong with that. I don't have an issue with pre-recorded podcasts, especially when the topics are not current events or anything like that. This was just two dudes talking about their lives and careers and whatever else. So it's not a big deal if they produce a month in advance. However, what makes this so funny is that they would have recorded this before Tom Segura's epic meltdown exactly. over having to check his bag at the yeah, airport exactly. where he went exactly. on Twitter and abused the TSA agent for two days straight. So here we have Tom Segura giving Matt Reif some of the most hypocritical advice I have ever seen. Dude, the yeah. courage of people on the internet is... Yeah, of course. And they don't want unbelievable any of this. I'll nah, dog. Right show them. Now. Show them what happens. What's up, dog? You don't want this. Nuts, man. Just trolls that live at home talking the most amount of. Of course, of course. But that's what I'm saying is that, like, yeah. You know. Why do you think it is that people that work that job? Hmm. Why do you think it is people who have a job that relies on them creating content online are incapable of understanding there's two sides to the comment section? There's one side that's going to suck your dick and say, tell you how great you are. And there's other people who take some pleasure and think it's fun in just pressing your buttons, aka trolling. Why do they get so butthurt about it? It really isn't that big of a deal. If you accept the praise and the dick sucking, you also have to accept the other side of the coin of people just thinking you're full of shit, you're terrible, calling you out about your face, telling you your nose looks awful, you're fat, you're this, you're that, your color, your race, your sexuality. It's going to happen all the time. It's the fucking internet. It's the wild, wild west. You cannot never and ever will control or win it. You just have to kind of embrace it and let bygones be bygones and keep it moving. Why are they incapable of understanding that the more you get, the more you play into it and do all this stuff and make it known that it affects you, the more they're gonna do it. You're not making it stop by being a badass and getting into the comments and telling people about their lives, telling them to pull up, saying you're gonna fight. It's like no one cares. The whole reason why they want you to press your buttons is because they want you to get in the comments saying what you're gonna say. <sighs> Again, maybe I'm not at that, maybe because I'm not at that level. Maybe at their level, the the sort of 
attention and the comments you're getting are at such a level that it sort of feels like they're real people because it's so much of it. It's like hundreds and thousands of people commenting at you, talking about your life, dissecting everything that you do. It's a bit much, maybe. But I just think if you decide to do this job where you're creating content, where you're, lit, you're existing in entertainment field and you're on social media, you have to accept that this is part of the game. You know, people say whatever, like all this stuff. I don't know, dude, you got like, I'm focused on all these other things. Yeah. And I go like, I, don't, I really don't have time. I don't want even one at risk, like entertain it. I'm just like, okay. Like, yeah. Go, I, go. I don't know. I don't know why I can't. You will. You'll let it go because it's going to be the, the more you're working and the more opportunities you get and the more things you have going on, you'll realize you have less time and less interest yeah. in responding and engaging. Wow, the best part is that Tom probably had no idea that this podcast would be dropping right after his Twitter meltdown. I doubt he's that clued into the production and release schedule. Oh man, that's funny as hell. And it also reminds me of that time when Tom tried to roast a bunch of us who were sick and tired of listening to him and his comedy brain buddies constantly going on and on about their new watches and cars. For a guy who's super busy and doesn't have time to concern himself with petty <laughs> negativity, he seems to spend a lot of time engaging in very petty true. negativity. Very, very you true. You just sit around and you, oh, you know what? You only have what you have because of fans. So don't talk about us like that. Yeah, but you're still a loser <laughs> if you're thinking like that. And so you're maybe, uh, I'm lucky to have you as a loser fan, but <laughs> you don't have to be that way. You could be a winner. You know, you just got to uh, change the way you think. And I'll tell you what, having access to hours of unfiltered brain farts from all these Muppets on their podcasts, you start to realize really quickly just how sensitive these guys are. I mean, it's truly incredible that with all of their fame and success, they spend so much time fixated on what people think of exactly. them. And it becomes a double-edged sword. Think about Tom Cruise or The Rock or even Dave Chappelle. Those guys have had such long and successful careers because they don't care what you think. They're just out there producing movies or doing stand-up. They don't sit around lecturing us on why we should love them and why we're all wrong for criticizing them. There's a, there's a subculture of cancel culture. Like Getting canceled is due to, due to something you did or at least allegedly did. Right? Right, right. But there's a subculture of people who, like, you didn't do anything wrong, but people just don't like you sure. enough that yeah. they go... Let's all collectively get together. If we all just talk about how much we hate this person so much, it'll spread. People not liking you is contagious, mm -hmm. even if there's for no reason whatsoever. And that's the kind of stuff that can make its way to not just regular people who are going to come out, to, who were thinking about coming out to shows. And then somebody told them I was an and they go, oh, well, then maybe I don't want to spend the money to, to come see him. And that can make its way into studio heads and networks. But and can they I go, tell you something? Don't like him, so. I'll tell you something about that, though. Mm. You have zero control over that. Zero. You have zero control yeah. over what people say about you, especially when your profile grows and is at a, a large place. You have zero. Here's what you do control. Who you are as a person, mm -hmm. how hard you work at your craft, how you treat people. Yeah. Like, those things... You do control. So if everyone's like, Matt's an a he's a of a person, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, you know what? I'm nice to people. I treat people with respect. Then you know that that narrative is a false narrative. And the most you can do, best you can do is ignore it and keep being a good person. Keep treating people well. Yeah. Treat, keep putting on the best shows you can put on. And that's who you are. You're not who people say you are. You know who you are. Yeah. Except for when you post it all over Twitter for the world to see. Yeah, that's awkward. Like, it's almost unbelievable that YMH would drop this podcast with Tom giving Matt advice on how to be a good guy and treat people well, literally days after Tom went off his rocket at a TSA agent over something that no one else really cared about. But yeah, I get it. Um, big up podcast cringe. Um, great video. Um, the Tom thing is, yeah, it's exhausting. It is what it is. Um, there's probably nothing worse than when two people who are successful on podcasting or in comedy get on pods together and start talking it turns into some boring conversation but it really is hard to get through i'm surprised people enjoy it over the years i think when i first got into these comedy podcasts they were quite fun to listen to people like do like inside baseball talk but after a while it gets so boring man you're just like enough's enough i, I don't want to hear this anymore please